What's the purpose of your life on earth? Do we ever ask, although we heard it said we ought to, uh, where have I come from? What am I here for? Where am I going? It all gets around understanding my purpose for life in the flesh on this earth. I think it would be a good idea if for one of these uh, men on the street interviews, just to interview, uh, interview several people and just say, would you mind telling me what you think your purpose on earth is? I think it would be quite an interesting uh, response. And I dare say a great many people, because they, well, you used to talk about eating from hand to mouth. I think they live from hand to mouth, just in the sense by that I mean just they never give any thought. It's whatever comes up. There's very little planning of any kind. They don't understand what they're doing. Is there a purpose to life? And I do not know how an atheist who says there is no God, everything's by happen chance, everything's a matter. I don't know how they find purpose in life. I guess the only thing they had to do is fight a non-existent God. <laughs> That's all they do. But it's a good, good question. And the Bible gives us the answer. Solomon was exceedingly rich and powerful king. But you'll notice that he was plagued by the same questions that bother a lot of folks today and should be questions that every human that's thinking at all should raise. His search for life's purpose is recorded with God's guidance, that is by inspiration, in the book of Ecclesiastes. And when you approach the study of that book, you must remember that it's written from the standpoint that if all there is to life is the material thing and what we do here in this fleshly body and nothing else, then what about this, that, and the other? And that's how he develops it all the way through. And he recorded some answers, of course. And this man who was granted uh, wisdom, knowledge from God, Second Chronicles 1-7, extremely rich person and very powerful king for his time, Second Chronicles 9, 13 and 22, is certainly worthy of being heard. God put what he had to say in the book. And that part of the book that for us as Christians was written before time for our learning. So there's much said here that pertains to life. If you just take wisdom as the world defines wisdom and knowledge as the world defines knowledge as to what is important knowledge, I'm afraid you'll find yourself rather empty when it all said and done. When it comes to Solomon, Scripture says Solomon's wisdom excelled the wisdom of all the children of the East Country and all the wisdom of Egypt, 1 Kings 4.30. And there were those who came to see this man whose fame for such things was renowned and certain ones said, Behold, after she had been around Solomon and seen all these things, Behold, the half was not told me. Thy wisdom and prosperity exceedeth the fame which I heard. 1 Kings 10, 1 and 7. If you read, uh, you'll see how wise he was, and I don't have time to develop these things, but he would be what modern people would call a psychologist, according to 1 Kings 3. And verse 16, and the verses to follow. He would be a biologist, 1 Kings 4, verse 32. And he certainly was an architect, 1 Kings 5, verse 5, and the verses following. And he was a, a ruler, 2 Chronicles 9, 26. If life's purpose is found in this kind of wisdom and knowledge, we would have to say Solomon surely found his purpose. But look at what Solomon, by inspiration, wrote. I gave my heart to know wisdom and to know madness and folly. I perceived that this also is vexation of spirit. For in much wisdom is much grief. 
And he that increaseth knowledge increaseth sorrow. Ecclesiastes 1, 17 and 18. So faced with the problems that come upon us all in living life in the flesh on earth, and the various events, some far more serious than others, that plague us, here's what he wrote. As it happeneth to the fool, so it happeneth even to me. And why was I then more wise? Then I said in my heart that they also, that this also is vanity. Remembering that vanity means it's pointless. It would be like having this with no water in it, and I need a drink of water, and I turn it up, and there's nothing there. That's vanity. It's pointless. And that's what he says. So the purpose of life demands living it to the fullest. Listen to this. Ecclesiastes 9.10 Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with all thy might. And here's what he's talking about. For there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave whither thou goest. Now, we constantly speak as Christians of our heavenly home. We sing songs like that. We just did. But you have to realize the viewpoint that he's writing from. If all there is is here and now and all there's going to be is of the material and the physical and time and space, then what's the point of it all? What good is it? You live 50 years, you live 75 years, you live 100 years, or as the patriarchs of old live several hundred years. But if all there is to it is what we deal with from day to day here, to what end is it all? What good is it? And yet it's easy to fall into that trap. You may obtain a great many educational degrees that may prepare you to do certain things things here on earth that you want to do and, and those degrees and various training certainly will prepare you and understand but they can never satisfy man's inner needs they never will because there's something else to be involved when it comes to the purpose of life if one gained all the wisdom in the world that the world had to offer then he would still be empty Paul warned, guard that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings and opposition of science falsely so called, which some professing have erred concerning the faith. Now, that was written to Timothy as to a preacher, what he needed to know for his own personal well-being spiritually, but what he needed to preach to others. And he warned them certain ones have already got so involved in these things of the present world, it's led them away from the faith. And there the word faith is used as it is in Jude 3, contend for the faith. It's the whole body of doctrine that is the gospel system. Somewhere or another they erred because they were involved in things that the world considers Highly important. So it takes far more than the wisdom of this present world to satisfy man's need for purpose in life. It's sad that when we have, let's say we didn't have the problems in our public educational system that we do as far as humanism and all that kind of thing. But if you just teach people how to make a living on earth and nothing else, they've still floundered. This place on earth is to get ready for heaven. That's the ultimate. Anything else we do is to get us through here without taking us away from our main goal, which is to find the gospel, believe and obey it from the heart, and let it form our character all the days of our life. Riches, of course, don't bring lasting satisfaction. The Bible declares, So King Solomon exceeded all the kings of the earth for riches and for wisdom. 1 Kings 10.23 
if you go back and look at his, uh, I guess we'd say it today, his uh, personal annual income in gold alone, it'd be worth in way over, and I don't know if we get an exact uh, amount as to today's worth of gold compared to then, but it would be well over $200 million today, 1 Kings 10, 14 and 21. Now, could riches make Solomon's life more meaningful? Well, listen to what he said. I gathered me silver and gold and the peculiar treasure of kings and of the provinces. Then he went ahead to say, Whatsoever mine eyes desired, I kept not from them. What's his conclusion? See, he got to do what we say. Oh, I wish I had a chance to do that. I heard somebody talking about a lot, the lottery. Besides it being gambling, the person was on television. He said, oh, I don't know what's got up to $800 million or something like that. And, uh, you know, just a f little bit more. He said, I, I just want the scraps. I don't care about getting the whole $800 million. If it's like $820 million, I'll take the twenty. But we're already that way in our society. So behold, he says, all was vanity and vexation of spirit, and there was no profit under the sun. What? You did what everybody professes they would like to do. Nothing was withheld from you, and you got it all from all over your kingdom and everywhere else. He says, it's vexation of spirit. And again, I'll remind you, it's because the book of Ecclesiastes is written from the standpoint of if, there, if this all there is to it is in the flesh, then really, come down to the end of your days, what have you got? Well, you got, got all this money you can give to somebody else. Now, well, what are they going to do with your hard-earned money? And more is said about that if you'll just read the book. Solomon learned the truth that riches often create problems. The sleep of the laboring man is sweet, whether he eat little or much, but the abundance of the rich will not suffer him to sleep. There is a sore evil which I have seen under the sun, namely, riches kept for the owners thereof to their hurt. Ecclesiastes 5, 12, 13. Well, our Lord came along in his earthly ministry. He simply said, A man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things he possesses. Luke 12, 15. And again, Paul would uh, say this to Timothy. Godliness with contentment is great. Gain. How many content people do you really know? Now, at various times in life, we may be irritated, but how many people do you really know that are just content? He went ahead to say, For we brought nothing into this world, and it's certain we can carry nothing out. And then that's when he says, For the love of money is the root of all evil. The Greek means the root of all kinds of evil. Which while some coveted after, that shows you how strong they wanted it. They have erred from the faith. Well, he said something about that earlier, about erred from the faith. And pierced themselves through with many sorrows. 1 Timothy 6, 6 through 10. Let me ask you a question in your life. How much money would it take you for you to be happy? You know what the answer is to most people? Just a little bit more. Because if you have $100,000, the fellow with a million is the rich fellow. The fellow with a million dollars, well, it's the guy that's got $10 million. He's the rich guy. And to the fellow with $10 million, it's the fellow that has $50 million. And so on you go. There's no end to that kind of thing. It, I don't know how you say it. It just develops. It's like a cancer maybe. Jesus put it this way then, for what is a man profited if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what should a man give in exchange for his soul? Matthew 16, 26. 
If you look at this country and we see all of its ills, all of its problems, and we talk about how it's so much worse than it was 50 years ago or 100 years ago or whatever, the problem is where it's always been. People are seeking complete contentment and happiness and purpose in life in things, in getting things, and using money represents all that. Riches just cannot satisfy man's real needs. They just can't do it. It's not by accident that when you look at the United States Senate that you have a whole host of millionaires. Have you ever wondered why? If you're a millionaire, why in the world will put yourself into that situation? Why can't you just go out on the lake and fish or do something? There's a simple answer. Power. Once you have money, people tend in general to want power, or they go hand in hand anyway. But then Solomon was world-renowned. He still is through the Bible. He was a man of honor. He was a prestigious person. Now listen to this. There came of all people to hear the wisdom of Solomon from all the kings of the earth which had heard of his wisdom. 1 Kings 4, 34. Pretty famous. And then in chapter 10 of 1 Kings and verse 24, all the earth sought to Solomon to hear his wisdom, which God had put in his heart. I would say that'd be like having all the famous people coming to your doorstep to see what you've got to say. And in that day and time, of course, we see that was Solomon. But his fame could not satisfy him. Solomon wrote, Pride goeth before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. Better it is to be of an humble spirit with the lowly than to divide the spoil with the proud, Proverbs 16, 18 through 19. So when Solomon looked at life with all of his power and his wealth, he said, many seek the ruler's favor, Proverbs 29, verse 26. And then they realized the truth. As it happeneth unto the fool, so it happeneth even to me. Then he goes ahead to say, And how dieth the wise man as the fool? Therefore I hated life, because the work that is wrought unto the sun is grievous unto me, for all is vanity and vexation of spirit. Ecclesiastes 2, 15 through 17. He had power. He had prestige, very knowledgeable, very wise, but it wasn't enough. Jesus warned about seeking the chief seats, places of honor in the eyes of men, and people to salute you in the marketplace because you're, quote, somebody the way the world describes somebody, Matthew 23, 6 and 7. But you know the praise of men is both fleeting and uncertain. It cannot satisfy. Solomon then had it all. He even loved, the scripture says, many strange women. And even, uh, he said, 700 wives and princesses and 300 concubines. You know what the little boy said about that. He got it all mixed up. He said 300 combines. First, <laughs> might have been better off if he had 300 combines. First Kings 11, 1 and 3. He wrote, I said in mine heart, go to now. I will prove thee with mirth. Therefore enjoy pleasure. And behold, this also is vanity. I said of laughter, it is mad. And of mirth, what doeth it? I sought it in my heart to give myself unto wine, 
I made me gardens and orchards. Goes ahead and say, I made me pools of water. I got me servants and maidens and had servants born in my house. And whatsoever my eyes desired, I kept not from them. I withheld not my heart from I withheld not my heart from any joy. Behold, all was vanity and vexation of spirit. Ecclesiastes 2, 1 through 7 and verse 10. Pleasure won't get it. Pleasure is not enough. Now most of us would have to agree that Moses found purpose in his life. But you notice that it was not found in pleasure as far as Moses' own pleasure. And lo and behold, as we've studied on Wednesday night in Ken's class, we find by faith Moses choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Hebrews 11, 24, 25. Now, in this case, we talk about Solomon being so wise. I would say Moses is far wiser than Solomon. There's a key phrase about pleasure as the world defines pleasure for a season. It doesn't last. Paul wrote in 1 Timothy 5, 6, She that giveth herself to pleasure is dead while she liveth. That describes so many people in our world. They're out for the gusto, as it used to be said. They're out to get what they can get. They give no thought of where I'm going to be really tomorrow hardly. Certainly not next year. How will it be? They just live for the moment. There are far too many empty lives in our society today because of that disposition of mind. They seek after a life of fulfillment and purpose, but they try to find it in the pursuit of pleasure. We can never know life's purpose until we know the source of life. God said, let us make men, man in our image after our likeness. And it says, so God created man after his own image. Goes further down and Moses writes, the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. Genesis 1, 26 through 27 and chapter 2, verse 7. There's something of man that is not found in any of God's creation. Solomon wrote, Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the Spirit shall return unto God who gave it. Ecclesiastes 12, 7. Now, he doesn't go into the details of where a person who lived a righteous life, where his spirit goes when he dies, or a person who's lived a sinful life where his spirit goes, that's dealt with elsewhere in the scriptures. It just simply means when the spirit returns to God who gave it, you go into the eternal realms, into the place God's provided. But it doesn't cease to be. The body returns to the dust, but not, not so of the spirit. So man who's formed from the dust dies and his body returns to us. But again, aren't we happy and glad to be able to declare that's not all of man. The spirit returns to God. So your purpose and mine is different from that of dogs and cows and other of God's creatures. Our purpose is clearly stated. We said it this morning. We said it more times than I can remember. But it ought to be said even more. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. Now that's, that's Solomon to the end of Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes 12, 13. After he's written that whole book from the standpoint of saying, here's where these people are who try everything to find purpose in life and happiness in life by the way the flesh calls pleasure and happiness and wealth and all that. But when he gets to the end of the book, he says, here's what you really learn. We might say it this way. If you can truly conclude anything, it's this. Fear God 
and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. That's the purpose of life. Wasn't hard to figure out, was it? A lot harder maybe to do or to get people to believe, but that's the purpose of life in the flesh on earth, to fear God and keep His commandments. That's the whole of man. The apostle wrote, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings and heavenly places in Christ. Now watch it. According as He hath chosen us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to Himself, according to the good pleasure of His will, to the praise of the glory of His grace. Ephesians 1, 3 through 6. Now that's where God would have us all in this life. But it takes a disposition of heart that says, I'm here to find God. That's all that really matters. And I'm here to learn His will and keep His commandments to obey the gospel, to live the Christian life. So before the world was, God had determined the purpose of life for human beings on this earth. And that purpose is found where? Well, according to the inspired Paul, in Christ. God created us. He gave us life so that we might bring glory to Him. Listen to what Paul said to the Ephesians. According to the eternal purpose, which He purposed, in Christ Jesus, Ephesians 3.11. Now that's the simple reason Paul writes that when we are baptized into Jesus Christ, we're baptized into His death. We are then what? Raised to walk in newness of life, Romans 6, 3 and 4. Only in Christ do we find the meaning and the purpose for which God created us in His own image and gave us life. When Jesus was about to depart from earth, he told the apostles, I go to prepare a place for you, John 14, 3. And when you consider in the writings of Paul that he looked forward to that place, you can see that in the Philippian epistle, chapter 1 and verse 21, and as he wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy 4, 6 through 8, don't you think that says for us that we should too? Our purpose in life is not to be found in these passing, transient, finite things. They all perish. As Paul expressed the true hope of a godly person, a Christian, a member of the Lord's church, and all the ordeal and trouble that came upon him, especially persecution for righteousness' sake, he says, Wherefore we faint not, but though our outward man is decaying or perishing, yet our inward man is renewed day by day. While we look not at the things which are seen, woe, do we? Do we measure our contentment? Our peace of mind by constantly looking at the things that are seen someday they will be around but at the things which are not seen how can I see something I can't see <laughs> because I have the word of God we talk about the eye of faith well faith comes from hearing the word of God Romans 10 17 well in that word of God I can see what God's promised and he keeps his promises for the things seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. 2 Corinthians 4, 6, all the way up through 5, 1. In verses to follow, verse 1. True purpose and fulfillment can never be found if our lives are centered on the affairs of this present world, only when we look beyond this life, when we look beyond the grave, can real meaning for life in the flesh here be found. Knowledge of this world, well, it's unending as to what you can learn 
follow that line. Therefore, no matter how vast it might be for you or me or somebody else, it will never satisfy the soul. We must know Jesus Christ as he reveals himself, know his gospel, the power of God to save us from sin, Romans 1.16. And be willing to abide by it, let come what may. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 1, 8, 18, The word of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us who are saved it is the power of God. Riches is not going to buy happiness nor contentment. This can only be done when we have the unsearchable riches of Christ. For godliness with contentment is great gain. Ephesians 3, 8, 1 Timothy 6 and 6. Those who love the praise of men aren't apt to think too much about God and seeking his praise because of what it demands. And I will say this, those who love the praise of men are doomed for a life of misery, both here and hereafter. Lasting true joy and pleasure as defined by God, is found in Christ among the faithful. As we close the lesson, I want to encourage you to go read the book of Ecclesiastes. Realize why it is in your Bible. Realize what it's saying to us today who have far more knowledge of godly things and spiritual things than Solomon ever did and what it means to us in motivation to focus on the spiritual. And we'll conclude that our duty, our whole duty, is to fear God and keep his commandments. If you're not a child of God, if you follow us closely, we studied exactly what to do to become a Christian. As a child of God, if you've sinned, we urge you to be of a tender heart and repent of your sins, confess those sins to God, and pray for forgiveness. If these things can help you, we hope they'll motivate you to act upon the truth that you know while we stand and sing.